Hi, church. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. So glad. Thank you for being here. If you're watching online, I'm glad you're here. I'm so blessed to know that uh, we're streaming live and we have that capability. So welcome. Hi, Mama. Glad you're here. Meet me in Luke chapter 7, would you? Luke chapter 7. I'm going to preach this morning from verse number 11 through 17. Luke 7, beginning with verse 11. This is the word of the Lord, my friends. Let all who have ears hear. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up, and he touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. What a wonderful story. I can't wait to tell you about it. Lord, not the wisdom of man, but manifest the power of the Holy Spirit so that our faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. Open our eyes and our ears, and Lord, we would love to leave here in a little bit less like who we were when we came in and more like you. We surrender to that in Jesus' name. Amen. A.W. Tozer said, whatever comes to your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. We'll let that rest a minute. Whatever comes to your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. And I think he's right. And you may need to think about that a little bit, but I think he's absolutely right, and I think that's a powerful statement. God is the most important person being the most important reality in all of the universe. And so what you think of the most important being, most important reality in all of the universe is indeed the most important thing about you. I think even atheists would probably agree with that statement, maybe. But they don't believe in God, and that's the most important part of them. What do you think about when you think about God? What comes to your mind first? Judgment? Wrath? Disappointment? Criticism? Is it grace? Is it love? Mercy? Compassion? Whatever comes to your mind first, whatever is there, just know there's a lot to that in the way you think and live your life. I thought about Tozer's quote, because as you know, if you attend this church, the past several weeks, we worked our way through the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and I said things like this. What Jesus teaches through the end here is loving, but it is blunt. It is hard teaching. teaching. It is hard to hear, hard to listen to. And as I said things like that, that it, it, it began to dawn on me that I wonder if that maybe gave you a wrong image of God that you may think is a complete image of God. I wonder if when you heard me say, or even saw, right? I'm not going to rehash it. You can go back to the sermon. When you saw, Jesus said one of two ways. Jesus said to people, I never knew you away from me. You don't build your house on the rock, your house, your life is tumbling down. You read and hear those things and then hear a preacher say to those things, this is, this is blunt, hard teaching, this is hard stuff to listen to if what you walked away from here thinking about is that 
Our Savior is an austere, rigid, unfeeling God. And I don't want you to think that. I don't think that's true in the least. Um, as human beings and as the Lord himself, we're like diamonds with many different facets to our personality, to our being, to our character. And to just focus on one facet and say, that's who I am, that's who you are, is unfair and it's incomplete. Uh, I knew a guy who played football who on the field was a ruthless animal, a merciless, ruthless animal who was about as mean as a snake on the field who would tackle you and grind you into the ground and talk about your mama the whole time he was doing it. I'm telling you, off the field was the kindest, softest-hearted guy you would ever want to meet. You'd never see him in a fight. I don't think you'd ever see him in an argument. He just loved. He was a great sense of humor. People loved to be around him. He was just that guy. On the field, stay away. At the end of the fourth quarter, when he walked off the field, a teddy bear. What was true about him? Both. I had a professor in college who, in class, was austere, black and white, rigid, no grace, no mercy, hand his syllabus out at the beginning of, of the quarter, and he would say on the first day, absolutely no excuses, no explanations, don't come to me with anything. The due dates you see on that syllabus are the due dates, period. Don't care what's happening in your life, period. And outside of that class, he, and by the way, he intimidated the, the jeepers out of me in that class. But outside was just as warm and kind and smiled all the time. He was just that guy, warm, warm guy outside of class. Which one? They're both. They're both. We're multifaceted. So when we see and we hear Jesus teach and we think, whew, this guy's black and white about how to live our life. This guy's black and white about how to get to eternity and to be with him. This is, this is on two ways. This is who this wow that's one facet. I love that we're moving into a section in the Gospel of Luke where now we see another facet to the character and life, personality of Jesus Christ. Because what we're going to get to see over the next few weeks, Lord willing, is how tender and compassionate he is. I just don't know better words. I thesaurus it, trust me. Tender. Tender, compassionate, soft-hearted, deep-feeling, loving, merciful Savior. There's three different stories we're going to see. One of them is about a guy who was in prison and he doubted whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. Now, it wasn't just any guy. It was John the Baptist. It was Jesus' cousin. It was the one who baptized him. It was the one who heard the voice from heaven say, This one is the one. This is my son. And whom I love, he's my beloved son. This was the one who, when John the Baptist saw him the next day, said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet when he was in prison, he sent a couple of his buddies, Go ask Jesus if he really is the one or if we should be looking for someone else. And Jesus, just as tender and compassionate with him as he could be. No criticism. No con condemnation. And then... After that, in Luke's gospel, we're going to get to see that woman who I've talked about quite a bit over the last several weeks, I think, that woman who burst into the Pharisee's house during a dinner party, uninvited, and found Jesus and went to his feet and wept and poured perfume and wiped his feet with her hair and loved him and worshiped. And with so much tenderness, Jesus looked at her and said, oh, your faith has healed you. You're forgiven of all your sins. Oh, how tender. Now, this was a woman who probably was a prostitute. I can't say that for sure. But we know from that word sinner that's used in that story, that, that, that's a person utterly devoted to sin. I call it this. This is a vocational sinner. And he's just so tender and compassionate with her. As you hear these stories over the next few weeks, you're going to sense, I hope, I'm going to, by God's grace, get you here, a magnetism to Jesus. 
You know what that means, right? It's just a, you're drawn irresistibly to this tender Savior who feels deeply for you. Today's story is about a, a widow mama who lost her son. Let me tell you the story. I just read it. Let me tell you the story and highlight a few things in it. This is after Jesus had left the um, time with the Roman centurion who he never really saw. Because you remember the Roman centurion said, don't come to my house. I'm unworthy of you doing that. Just say the word and you'll heal my servant. And indeed he did. After that, Luke tells us that a great crowd and his disciples were following him. Luke is so careful to tell us that several times. A great crowd and his disciples. What, what is he saying? What he's saying is people who have surrendered to Jesus, given their life to Jesus, are going to follow Jesus with all who they are, were following him, and so were others who had not done that. A crowd. Maybe they're to see the show. Maybe he's a spectacle and what he's doing is a spectacle and so they follow along. Maybe they had loved ones who were sick or diseased or lame and they were waiting for their turn. Whatever it was, there was a crowd who were not born again, if you will, weren't followers of Jesus and his followers. And they, they were following Jesus away from where this happened in the, with the Roman centurion and they entered a town called Nain and they walked through the gate and as they did, they were met face to face with a funeral procession. Now, funeral processions in, in those days are unlike ours today. As a matter of fact, ours today are unlike what they used to be. Uh, the first funeral that I ever preached was in 1988. And funeral processions were a big deal in those days in the Midwest, in Ohio. It was a big deal. You'd pull into the parking lot and the funeral director would have you roll your windows. You go into the cemetery? Yes. He'd put a big sign, magnetic sign on top of your car. He'd say, line up over there. You'd line up, you'd go in for the service, you'd come out, and there'd be this long line going to the, to the uh, cemetery. He'd go around and point to everybody, put your high beams on, put your high beams on, and there was always a uniformed police officer on a motorcycle that would lead you. Always. Doesn't matter, though. I, I, I've done it in zero degrees. I've done it with tons of snow, and I got to know one really well. I said to him, Earl, how do you stay warm out there? He said, I line my body with newspaper. It's the best thing I could find. But Earl would have a whistle. He loved his whistle. And boy, when we would pull out, he would stop the traffic, blow that whistle. He'd get to the first intersection, park that bike right in the middle of the intersection, and he'd stop all those cars. And didn't matter what color the light was, the procession went through. And after a bit, he'd speed to the next one, and we'd all get to the cemetery that way. In those days, it used to be, too, that cars that were around would pull over and stop in respect for the deceased. They were bigger deals in those days, processions, and it was a really big deal in the first century for Jewish people when they lost someone and how they proceeded to the burial spot, a big deal. Now, before I tell you a little bit about it, I can just give you a picture of it, and that is if you've ever seen a New Orleans procession, you might get this one a little bit. Anybody ever seen a procession in New Orleans? If you haven't, now I've never been there, but go home and YouTube it. And you'll see something unique and awesome, wonderful, as far as I'm concerned. You'll see going through the streets of New Orleans in the front is the minister and the family. And behind them is a small band of horns and drums. And behind them is a horse-drawn carriage with the casket on it. And behind them is a throng of mourners. And they make their way through the streets slowly. And that band will begin by playing dirge music, just mournful music. And they'll work their way up to some old hymns. And not long, they break out in the most jubilant jazz music you can imagine. What's so cool is the crowd follows right along. When it's a dirge, they're mourning and weeping and moving slow. When it's a hymn, they're singing along. And old buddy, when the jazz breaks out, they go on. They have whistles. They're blowing the whistles. They're dancing. They're celebrating. It's a New Orleans procession. Almost like it were the first century Jewish processions, minus the horse, minus the band. The family would lead the procession, and behind them would be a group of men who we call pallbearers today, bearers. And they would be carrying or moving the casket on what is called a bier. It says it in the text, B-I-E-R. Looks like buyer, it's beer. And a beer is just whatever the casket sits on. You can go to a funeral home today, and what it's sitting on is called a beer. But when they were processing, usually they had built a frame 
for the casket to sit in with long handles that the, the pallbearers could hold on to or even hoist on their shoulders and walk along. Jesus and this great crowd and lots of his disciples walked into this town and they came face to face with this procession. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw the widow there out in front who had lost her son, he had compassion on her. Oh, I'm coming back to that. You know it. And what did he do? He walked around, and Luke tells us he put his hand on the beer. Oh, that was a no-no. Mosaic law, you could read about it in Numbers, right around Numbers 24. Mosaic law said that if you touched a dead body or anything to do with a dead body, you were ceremonially, ceremon I never can say that. You just were unclean. How about that? Just unclean is what you were. And I love what one commentator said about this, Jesus touching this beer the way he did. He said that it was impossible for death to be transmitted to him, and only life would be transmitted through him when he touched this beer. Isn't that awesome and beautiful? Powerful. And that's what he did. He stopped him, and he put his hands on that beer, and he said to the, the widow's son who was in there, rise. Oh, yeah. Rise. And Luke tells us he sat up immediately. You know, he's the only one that can talk to a dead body and do that. Last week I told you in the text what we saw is that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he just spoke the word away from that centurion's house and his servant was healed. And here he is, hands on the casket, looking at this man dead in the casket. And he speaks to the dead body and says, come back. Rise. And Luke tells us that he sat up in the casket and began to speak. I just love that Luke says that. He began to speak. And I'm wondering, what did he say? Why did you tell us what he said, Luke? Why did you just write that? What did he say? I'm thinking, I bet if I sat up like that, I'd be, I am starving. Maybe that's what I'd say first. <laughs> or maybe he just looked in the cat. What is going on here? I don't know what he said, but then maybe the tenderest part of the entire story is when he tells us that Jesus took him and gave him to his mom. Now, there's a statement in this story that really lets you know what's going on in this scene. I want you to see it in Luke chapter 7. Let's start in verse 13. It's, it's in 14. Let's start in 12. As he, Jesus, drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. And here it comes. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. In that statement is this entire story. You need to know that this is a woman who's already buried her husband. And we know this is her last son. Uh, you got to know, too, that in the first century, this sounds so cold, but it's so true, historically true, widows were treated like chaff. They were some of the most marginalized people in all of society. When they did not have a husband and had no son to care for them, they were, they were um, to a point in life where they had to totally depend upon the benevolence of other people just to eat. They were treated like animals. They were treated mean. You would pass them by. They were beggars. Most of the time they end up losing their homes because nobody could take care of them and they lived on the streets. Remember, we, we, we saw this. Remember when Jesus was watching the people come and put money in the, in the temple treasury and he told us about that little old widow that shuffled in and the text tells us that she put in less than a penny and Jesus said, that's all she has to live on. Why? Why? She's a widow, no one caring for her. She put more in than everyone else because she put in everything that she had to live on. This also is why Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5 really clear instructions that families must take care of widows in their family, have to take care of widows. And if they have no family, Paul goes through and says that the church then has to take care of the widows. He even gets real specific in that chapter. Keep a registry, make a list of those who are widows without family and you need to take care of them because this is how widows were treated in the first century. And her only son had died. 
And Jesus, looking at her with compassion, he knew what was ahead for her. She knew what was ahead for her. She knew in that casket was her really only hope of really surviving, thriving, eating, knowing day by day that you're going to eat. She knew all that was gone, and now she knew that she'd be waking up every morning and wondering if she would eat, and know she's going to have to go out and beg if she's going to get anything to eat. And Jesus looked at her, and he saw this, and he had compassion on her and raised that boy, and it is enough to get your son back from the dead. But to get some security and to know you're going to be cared for is just powerful too. You see, that's what's going on here. It's not just a story, though. It's not just a historical event, though it is. But as any story or any section of Scripture that we have, it's meant to bring something to us. It's meant to teach us. It's, it's meant to reveal something about God. And in this story, we really learn something about Jesus that we need to learn and take to heart. And the first one that I want you to know I want you to know, and it's right from this little phrase in verse 13, watch it, and when the Lord saw her, um, there's the title of my sermon, he saw her. And I want you to take away from there that he sees you too. He sees you. That word Saul is a, is, comes from a Greek word that's normally not translated Saul. It's almost always translated to know or to understand. There are primarily two Greek words that are translated to know in the New Testament. The first is gnosko. And gnosko is a unique kind of knowledge. It's that, it's that just beginning to know. It's that immature knowledge. It's that incomplete knowledge. It's a knowledge that you're just starting to get and you're going to continually to grow in. That's gnosko. The other one translated to know or understand is a Greek word, ido, and it means full, complete, perfect knowledge. You just know everything about that person or this thing or whatever else it is. Ido means you can't learn anymore, you know it all. Now, I want to show you how these are used. I love that a few different times in the Gospel of John, both of these are used in the same verse. So meet me in John 8, will you? Are you with me out there? Give me an uh-huh. You're awake? I know these overcast days can do you in, but go to John chapter 8. I want to show you these. And look at verse 55, John 8, 55. Jesus talking about the Father, he says this, But you have not gnosko him. I ido him. If I were to say to you, I do not ido him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do ido him, and I keep his word. What's he saying? Jesus is looking out of the crowd and saying, you haven't even begun to know the Father. You don't even have the beginning point of the knowledge of the Father. I know the Father perfectly, completely, fully. I know him. Go to John 13. Remember this chapter where Jesus is washing the apostles' feet in John 13? Remember, he wrapped the towel around his waist, filled a basin with water, started making his way around. And remember when he got to the apostle Peter, Peter, who I think admirably, Peter said, you can't wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, I, I can't have anything to do with you. But look, look what he says in verse number 7. Jesus answered him, Peter, and said, what I am doing, you do not ido. You don't ido right now, but afterwards you will gnosko. You don't understand fully what's about to happen to you, me washing your feet. You do not have full, complete knowledge of what I'm about to do to you. But you're going to get to know this in a little while, and that knowledge is going to grow and continue to grow in you, Peter. Ido, Gnosko. Now back to our text. When our text says that Jesus entered the town and he saw her, that's Ido. He knew her completely. He knew her absolutely. He knew her perfectly. And of course he did. He created her. 
Of course he did. The Bible tells us that he wrote her story already. Of course he did. The Bible tells us that he numbered her days. Of course he did. The Bible tells us that he reigned supreme over her. Of course he knew absolutely everything about her. He knew her insides. He knew her outside. He knew her history. He knew her pains. He knew her discouragements, her disappointments, her scars, her joys. He knew that she'd already buried her husband. He knew that this was her only son. He knew all of this as he walked in this town. He knew it when he saw her complete and total understanding and knowledge of this woman. Jesus is the one, Psalm 139 tells us, who knit her together in her mama's womb. He knew her. He understood everything perfectly about her. There wasn't a thing he didn't understand about her. And I want to tell you something, church, and I do hope you're with me, because here's why I showed up this morning, was to look at you in your eyes and tell you, he sees you too. He knows you perfectly. He knows you better than you know you. He knows perfectly what you're in the middle of right now. He knows your past. He perfectly knows your future. He knows what's paining you the most right now. He knows what aches the most in your soul right now. He understands. He gets it. He knows your body completely and perfectly. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what you're going to face tomorrow. He understands you perfectly. And what I wanted to say in showing up here today is that I firmly believe, because it's my experience, that one of the things we want and or need the most is to be understood. That someone would get me, get what I'm in the middle of, understand what I'm in the middle of, give me some empathy because they've been there. When I was in the deepest, darkest times of depression back in the early 2000s, lots of people were very encouraging and wonderful to me, but let me talk with someone who knew and tasted or maybe was in a deep, dark clinical depression, maybe a mile or two down the path ahead of me, oh, that person I really clicked with. They got it. I was talking to somebody not too long ago who knew me in those days, and this person happens to be in a pretty deep depression right now too, and said, I remember once when you said when you'd go to a restaurant or someplace that you'd look around you and it looked to you like everyone else was just fine and having fun and you were the only one with a dark cloud over you. And this person said, I get that now. I get that. I understand. I understand. I thought I need to find a clever illustration for this point, so I put in the Google search, how important is it to be understood? And I clicked that search, and I started scrolling through, and I was really surprised at something I saw. Link after link after link after link. You know what the headings were? That children and teenagers need to be understood more than anyone or anything else. Children and teenagers. They need to be understood. They don't need to be told when they tell you they're sad. Don't be sad. You don't have to be sad. Think positive thoughts. They need to feel like they're understood, that they're heard, whether you agree or not, whether you think it's valid or not. They need validated. They need understood. I got a little bitty grandson named Fletcher, and he's not quite talking yet. But his mama, uh, Melissa, says to me, or she said to me a couple of different times, you know, it's just so tough where he is right now because he might get crying and upset, but he can't tell me what's upsetting him, what's going on, and I don't know. And she said, it's so frustrating. I don't understand. He doesn't know how to tell me what's going on. And it's just that don't understanding time right there because it's of utmost importance for us to be understood. It's at the core of almost every marital counseling session that I've, I've been in or counseling people. I, I, almost every one, at one point, 
The wife may say, or the husband, right? Both ways. The wife may say, he just doesn't understand me. He just doesn't get it. Or he'll say the same thing. She doesn't get me. She doesn't want to understand me. She doesn't get it. And then sometimes I'll say, are you saying da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da? And she'll go, yeah. Yeah. Listen, we want to be understood more than we want to be fixed. We just want somebody to listen and understand and love us where we are. Now, I draw your attention to that so that I could read Hebrews chapter 4 for you. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation because it's so accurate and it's so good the way they did it. Listen to Hebrews 4.15. This high priest, that's Jesus, this high priest of ours understands. I don't. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You see, when you start to somehow believe that he understands and gets you, there should be a magnetism that's born in that relationship that draws you to him because maybe no one else on earth understands. He does. He gets it. He may not have tested the specifics that you're in, but I'm telling you, whatever suffering and pain and disappointment or scars that are in you, he gets it. He understands. And what's he say as a result? Come to me because I get it, and I'll give you mercy and grace and help that'll get you through this time. I understand. So if he doesn't understand you, and she doesn't understand you, and teenagers, if you don't feel understood, at some point you got to stop and say, thank you that you get it at least. Thank you that you understand and you're with me. And listen, listen, not only does he get it in his head, but he then moves towards you in compassion and tenderness. That's the second thing I want you to see. Oh, you know what that word compassion, that word literally means deep in the bowels. Because listen to this, in those days, in those days, they thought the seat of all emotion was found in the digestive tract. And we laughed and we jeered at them and they, we said they weren't as evolved and understanding as we are. But guess what we know now? Your gut and bowels are filled with neurotransmitters. That sets mood. As a matter of fact, they now call it the gut-brain axis. And they're getting the last laugh. Because they knew it all along, that this is where it came from. So when we read that word compassion, you know what it's saying? Jesus felt her Deep inside him. He understood her and he felt what she felt. And it moved him to compassion and it moved him toward her in tenderness. And you too, hear me today, you too. He moves toward your shame with tender compassion. He moved towards what makes you feel guiltiest all the time, he comes to that with tender compassion. Like the woman he caught in adultery, or was caught in adultery, and he said, I don't condemn you, my dear. Or the prostitute that was at his feet, and he said, your faith has healed you. You're all forgiven, hon. He moves towards your hurt. He moves towards your pain. He moves towards those scars. He moves towards everything going within you in tender mercy, in loving compassion. That word that's translated compassion is only used 12 times, or I should say used 12 times in the Gospels. Every single time it's used in connection with Jesus, but one time. The Gospel writers really wanted us to know this about Jesus, that he was a compassionate Savior. He is a compassionate Savior. Remember when he fed 5,000 people? You know how that got started, do you remember? That got started when there was this huge crowd. Obviously, at least 5,000 of them were out there. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, it's supper time. And I know these folks are hungry and I have compassion on them. So let's feed them dinner. 
You know what he's saying? I could just feel it in me. They're hungry. <laughs> I'm getting them. Another time, one of my favorites, it says that he looked out over the crowd and he felt deeply for them because to him they looked harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. Our God is not an unfeeling, detached God who just cognitively and in his head gets you. He understands you and knows you perfectly and he feels what you feel. I love how Eugene Peterson renders this statement in, in the message when he says when he saw her, his heart broke for her. He's near the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. He's with you. He understands you. He feels you. Well, I have about eight minutes, I'll take ten. <laughs> because I'm going to, maybe not ten, I'm going to hit this from two angles that I haven't even mentioned. They're unrelated, really, to what I just said, but I just have to mention them. I kept thinking all week, how do I make the smooth transition into this? And I thought, well, there's just no way. Just tell them there's no smooth transition. you got to come at this in two different ways. And I, I brought these points, or I got these points, I just have to tell you, uh, from Brennan Manning. If you've never read any Brennan Manning, oh boy, go get some Brennan Manning books. Absolutely. Get Abba's Child, then go to Ruthless Trust, right? Then go to uh, uh, Ragamuffin Gospel and go through these. But his book, listen to the title of this book, The Wisdom of Tenderness, What Happens When God's Fierce Mercy Transforms Our Lives. Oh, that's a great title, isn't it? God's Fierce Mercy. And I love that he calls, it, this is about wisdom, because here's what he's saying. What happens to someone? What wisdom is birthed in the life of someone who has experienced and lives in the experience of the fierce tenderness and mercy of God? If you've tasted it, and you love how tender and compassionate he is to you, then what happens to you? What happens in your life then? What's the wisdom that's birthed there? And I'm going to point out two. One is this. To know the tender compassion of Jesus is to finally be free. It's to finally be free. Manning writes, The tenderness of Jesus frees us from embarrassment about ourselves. He lets us know that we can risk being known, that our emotions, our sexuality, our fantasies are all purified and made whole by his healing touch. He's tender. And that we don't have to fear our fears about ourselves. The wisdom gleaned from tenderness is that as ragamuffins loved by God, we can love ourselves and thereby learn to truly love others. When the healing tenderness lays hold of our hearts, the false self, ever vigilant in protecting itself against pain and seeking only approval and admiration, dissolves in the tender presence of Jesus. That's freedom. That's freedom. When you open by faith your heart, life, your current, your iniquities, your sin, your pain, your past, when you open that up to his tender, compassionate touch, you're free from a guilt, shame, and self-consciousness. You're freed from it. Which leads me to the second thing. And that is to know the tender compassion of Jesus is to be tender and compassionate to others. That's how you'll know you know it. Manning writes, The heart enveloped in, ten in the tenderness of God passes that tenderness around indiscriminately, making no distinction between the worthy and the unworthy. I just love that statement. When you know the tender compassion that Jesus has for you, you indiscriminately Pass it around to others around you, whether they deserve it or not. 
compassion and tenderness because you know the tender, compassionate one. I wonder if a day ever went by where mama and her son didn't think about that day. I just doubt it. I think every time she sat down at the dinner table with her, her, her daughter-in-law and her grandkids, she thought about that day and felt so thankful for the tender compassion of Jesus. I bet every time he made his way to the table and he saw his mama with his wife and his kids sitting at that table, knowing she's safe, knowing she's about to get a full belly of food, and knowing that she's okay, he thought about that time when he sat up in that casket and the Lord took him by the hand and handed him to his mom. He saw them. He saw them. And he sees you. Lord, it's one thing to hear that. It's one thing to even acknowledge it. It is so different for so many to let it seep into all the crevices of our soul. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, let it saturate every one of our lives. And oh, Jesus, how thankful we are for showing us the way and being so tender with us along the way. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Take two minutes early. <laughs>